Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of May 19th, 2014. Before we get started, once again, I just want to remind everybody that uh, we re recently had our annual University of Maryland Emergency Medicine Residency EKG competition on April 30th, and we're going to be reviewing the answers to that 20-question competition on next week's EKG video uh, case of the week. It's obviously not going to be a case of the week. It's going to be an EKG competition for the year. But we're going to go through those questions. There's 20 questions. And don't cheat now. Try to do this uh, competition on your own. Go to this website here. You do not need to put www first. Just go to lectures.umem.org 2014 ECG competition. Download the PDF and try to take the test on your own because you'll get a lot more out of uh, our review next week if you actually try to take the competition on your own. And besides, if you want to challenge yourself, uh, go ahead and challenge yourself. Th these are all real cases, real patients that showed up in our emergency department or several other emergency departments. A few of the cases actually I borrowed from the EKG video series, so some of you may recognize those cases, especially if you've been a regular follower of this weekly series over the past, uh, I guess, uh, two and a half, almost, almost three years now. Well, no, closer to two and a half years. Anyway, let's go on and do this week's case. Actually, we've got four cases this week, and there's one central theme for the four cases we're going to review. Our first case was uh, sent in by Dr. Anver Sethwala, who was an intern at Northwest Regional Hospital in Tasmania. At least he was an intern when he sent this case. Maybe he's his second year now. But anyway, it was a, a really great case. And he happened to be working one day. There was an 84-year-old woman that presented with some shortness of breath. She has a history of hypertension and diabetes. So this sure as heck sounds like a case of acute coronary syndrome. An EKG was obtained. And the patient, as you see, has uh, some T-wave inversions in a couple of the inferior leads. There's also some T-wave inversions in V1, V2, V3, and V4. Are these new or old? Well, they did have an old EKG and it appears that the T-wave inversions are pretty much all new in the inferior and also in the anterior septal lead. So here's an 84-year-old woman who's got a bunch of cardiac risk factors, and she's got ischemic T-wave inversions. This is a piece of cake case of acute coronary syndrome. So, uh, and just to add something to boot, she's got an elevated troponin, so the patient was admitted to the medicine team with the diagnosis of non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. No problem here. Well, then enters Dr. Seth Walla, who heard about the case and he saw the 12 lead EKG and he immediately knew that this is not a non-STEMI. In fact, if you call this a non-STEMI, here's what's going to happen. You're going to admit the patient, get a bunch of troponins. The troponins will not elevate. They'll stay slightly elevated. And then you're going to say, well, maybe it's not an MI, and maybe we'll just continue uh, trending the troponins. They will not rise. And so you're going to say, well, maybe it's a nothing. Maybe you take the patient off the heparin, put them on some aspirin. Maybe you put them on beta blockers, and then you send them home. Maybe you even send them for a cath, and the cath ends up being negative, and you send them home. Why do I say that's probably what would happen? I'll tell you why, because that's exactly what's happened in hospitals that I've worked at in the past, exactly what's happened. And then what happened in those cases, the patient was discharged on aspirin and beta blockers and went out and dropped dead. And what was the diagnosis? What was missed? Everybody said there's cardiac risk factors, there's T-wave inversions, there's a slight bump in troponin. This is clearly acute coronary syndrome, but we rule them out and the patient goes home and dies. Well, here's the diagnosis that was missed, PE, all right? So obviously, uh, that's not the proper management of a PE. This patient needs to be discharged on anticoagulation. And if you mistakenly call this acute coronary syndrome and do an ACS workup, and the ACS workup ends up being negative, and you discharge a patient, they go home and die. And I've seen three cases of exactly that story. Patient gets admitted, ruled out for ACS. Everyone only thought ACS because of the T-wave inversions. Patients got discharged and died because nobody realized that PEs are notorious for causing ischemic-looking T-wave inversions. Anyway, this patient did get a CTA thanks to Dr. Seth Walla, 
who recognized the finding on the 12 lead EKG. He ordered the CTA and got uh, the diagnosis of bilateral PEs, including a saddle embolus and evidence of right heart strain, and the patient was properly diagnosed. So let's talk a little bit about EKG findings in PE. These are the classic things everybody learns about, right? Everybody learns sinus tachycardia. Everybody with the PE has sinus tachycardia, right? Wrong. Absolutely wrong. It is a myth that's been passed down through the generations that everybody has tachycardia. In fact, if you look at the very biggest international studies that have been done, the Europed and the Pyoped studies on PE, they take a look at the EKGs. If you take a look at all of those patients with PEs, only 30 to 50 percent of patients with PEs in those studies had tachycardia. And those were not even uh, limited to large PEs. If you only look at large PEs, maybe the numbers are a little bit better. But please, the bottom line here is do not ever rule out PE just because somebody has a normal heart rate, okay? But anyway, that's classic. S1, Q3, T3, in other words, a big S wave in lead one, a Q wave in lead three, and a flip T wave in lead three, classic. What does classic in medicine mean? 15%, all right? New right bundle or incomplete right bundle. In other words, a tall R wave in V1, classic, not that common. Superventricular or ventricular dysrhythmias. Rarely you can get ST elevation or ST depression and T wave inversions. Here's the key point from this. If you look at the EKG literature and look at studies which were done on patients just limited to large PEs, it turns out that T wave inversions may be one of the most common EKG abnormalities in case series of large PEs. Maybe as many as 50%, maybe even more, of patients with large PEs, those submassive and massive PEs, will present with T wave inversions. And it's important to remember that because a lot of times patients are misdiagnosed as ACS when they have large, when they have these T wave inversions, and then they get worked up for ACS, and the workup is negative, and they get discharged home just like the three cases that I've seen myself, all right? Now, the one other pearl I'm going to give you here is that uh, something, actually something that Marriott and other electrocardiography gurus for decades have talked about, T-wave inversions when they occur simultaneously in the anteroceptal plus the inferior leads together, that tends to be very predictive of PE. In fact, we did a study and published it uh, just a few years ago, and in our series, about 75% of the time, if somebody had new T-wave inversions in the inferior plus anteroceptal leads, it was a PE, not acute coronary syndrome. There's one study by Kasugi, an American journal of cardiology, I think it was. They said 99% of the time, patients with new T-wave inversions in the inferior and anteroceptal leads turn out to have a PE. Incredible. Don't call these ACS. These are, when you see flip T-waves in the inferior and anteroceptal leads together, that's a PE number one. Number two, it's a PE. Number three, number four, number five, it's a PE. And then after you've ruled out PE, 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 and PE, then you start thinking about acute coronary syndrome. Get the picture. Don't miss PE by being misled by T-wave inversions, okay? Why does this occur? Why do new T-wave inversions and ischemic findings occur with PE? There's a lot of theories, but not a whole lot of research. As you know, anytime there's more than one theory, it means people really don't know. Is it subendocardial ischemia causing subendocardial, um, or subendocardial hypoxia producing ischemia? Is it, are there some vasoactive substances? I don't even know what those are. I left that information way back when I was a second year medical student. It's gone. Right ventricular distension can cause some shifting of the axis and give you new axis changes, new tall R waves in V1, myocardial irritability, all kinds of theories, but nobody has a definite answer. Bottom line, who cares? When you see new T wave inversions in a chest pain or shortness of breath patient, think PE number one, two, and if it's flip T waves in the inferior and anteroceptal leads together, it's PE number one, two, three, and four, and five, and ACS is number six, all right? Let's look at a couple more cases here. Just to hammer this point home, Dr. Howard Kim, who's a third year resident in Denver, a Denver Health Residency in Emergency Medicine, fantastic residency program, fantastic skiing. It's a mile high. Why is the fact that it's a mile high important? Because they had a patient at that airport, a mile high. It's a 21-year-old woman who is running 
to catch a connecting flight, right? I've done that before, by the way, and you completely lose your breath. I mean, I run, I do other things like that, but running through the airport in Denver is really quite a workout. Uh, and uh, anyway, so she got short of breath and she was hypoxic. No surprise, she's a mile high. It's 5,000 feet elevated, that city, and uh, she's short of breath. Um, but uh, I think what happened here, I think she actually had a syncopal episode. So they got a 12 lead EKG and guess what? New T wave inversions, inferior and antraceptal. Diagnosis, PE, right? If you didn't know the diagnosis, you're not listening. This is a pulmonary embolism. And on bedside echo, she had right heart strain as well. This is a big PE. These are usually not tiny PEs. These are usually big PEs. She ended up getting TPA and her symptoms completely resolved and she caught her connecting flight right after that. Well, maybe not. Um, I'm hopeful that she did eventually make it to wherever she was going, but probably not that day. Uh, case number three, Dr. Adam Friedlander and Dr. Ryman Wilborn, uh, who are phys emergency physicians in Atlanta. Uh, Adam, by the way, is a graduate from our Emergency Medicine Pediatrics five-year residency program. So he's a superstar emergency physician and emergency pediatrician and uh, he graduated in 2011. He sends me great cases all the time. They had a, a case like this, a 76-year-old guy who was out on the golf course with a tight breathing sensation, and he made it very clear that it wasn't shortness of breath and it wasn't chest pain, right? Don't you love it when patients say, no, it's, it's not chest pain, it's just this discomfort. It's an elephant sitting on my chest, but it's not chest pain, right? Uh, anyway, this guy's saying, it's not shortness of breath or chest pain, it was just a tight breathing sensation for whatever that means. Uh, anyway, that occurred a day earlier, but then on the day that he came in, it was because he actually had a syncopal episode. He also has a positive troponin, so this is sounding a lot like acute coronary syndrome, and if you didn't watch this video before, you'd say, well, there's positive troponin, an elderly guy, syncope, he's got flipped T waves in the inferior leads, he's got flipped T waves in the anterior septal, actually even in all the anterior leads, this is acute coronary syndrome. No, it's not. This is a submassive pulmonary embolism uh, that they were able to diagnose. He had right heart strain as well. New flip T was inferior and in the anterior leads in this case, but really new flip T was inferior and anteroceptal. Think big PE. And case number four is by one of our current second year residents. This is, this is a superstar resident, Dr. Yemi Adebayo. I don't know if he's listening to this video. Uh, he should be. All of our residents are supposed to be watching these videos. And so if he's not watching this video, then I take it back. He's not a superstar. And if he is watching this video, uh, Yemi, don't let it go to your head. But anyway, um, he had an 80-year-old woman who had a history of lung cancer, presented with shortness of breath and hypotension. So I think most everybody's going to get a 12-lead EKG and work this patient up for ACS and PE together. But the patient's got flip T waves inferior and anteroceptal. So... What are you going to do? You're going to work the patient up for PE, 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 and if that comes up negative, then uh, maybe another workout for PE, and then you think acute coronary syndrome. Well, she ended up being diagnosed with a submassive PE on the first workup. So again, I, I can't overemphasize how important this is. When you see flip T waves in the inferior and anteroceptal leads together, that is a PE until proven otherwise. It is so important. I know of three patients who would be alive today if the treating physicians had remembered that within our own city, all right? Um, but instead, they were worked up for ACS. The workup was negative. They went home, and they dropped dead of a massive PE. So quick take-home points. There's a lot of PE uh, EKG findings that we've learned about. Go back a handful of slides to take a look at that whole list. I'm going to narrow this down. When you get large PEs, probably the more common things, you will more commonly see sinus tachycardia, but still only about 50%, I'm guessing. 50, not nearly 100%. New T-wave inversions are at least as common as sinus tachycardia when we're talking about large PEs. Rightward axis is not uncommon. I'm, I'm going to say 20 to 30%. But what is very specific, and I'm going to say it for about the, the billionth time now, is that when you have simultaneous T-wave inversions in the inferior plus anteroceptal leads together, that, folks, is a PE until proven otherwise. All right, And I'll credit Dr. Henry Marriott for, uh, for writing about this decades ago. He wrote about it in many of his books, 
And because of the stuff that he wrote about, um, I've been able to save lives. Many other people have been able to save lives. And if you remember what Marriott and a few other people talked about decades ago, you will save lives also. Flip T waves, inferior and interceptor leads, think pulmonary embolism. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. And uh, again, don't forget to take that EKG competition test. Next week, we're going to review all 20 answers to the questions. All right, so until next week, please take care.